Thank you. So as this is getting set up, um, my name is Matt Applegate. Our other two presenters, uh, Sarah Evans, Catherine Schmidt. So I'll, I'll give some background um, on our project that we're presenting, um, institutional background and history of the project. So where we, we work at a small liberal arts college on Long Island, uh, New York. It's um, primarily uh, professionally focused. So students attend often because they want to be nurses or they want to go into business. Um, but we exist in a small department, a digital humanities and new media, primarily new media program. Um, the, we don't really have any kind of institutional funding really outside of our department budget. Um, and we are the support. We, you, the faculty that you're, that you're looking at are the, the people at the institution that represent this area. So the project that we uh, are gonna present on is now many years long. Um, and it was an attempt to sort of uh, introduce students across the institution to new media and digital humanities um, within a kind of specialized program that we offer. So what we uh, built essentially is a kind of a digital production, digital storytelling and mapping project that we've used in short term study abroad opportunities. So anywhere from a week to two weeks uh, our institution offers these uh, opportunities to students. They're sponsored by faculty, usually by a department. Faculty travel with students. Um, so we've done this technically four times, but three to one particular country to Italy. Um, so our idea for this kind of programming was, can we teach digital storytelling, um, some GIS work, um, to a pretty mixed population of students? Um, some are majors, some just taking it for general education credit, some taking it um, as elective credit. So what we decided to do is a little bit different from typical, I think, GIS work in, in digital humanities in the sense that the project we built focuses on student experience on site. So they're collecting data on site. They are building their storytelling projects on site with some research um, ahead of time. So for us, given that it's primarily pedagogically focused and focused on an undergraduate population, we're really thinking about experiential learning um, and you know the co a contrast to a kind of uh, typical um, essay project, for example. So what we focused on in these classes um, was basically kind of three things. For our map, we used Mapbox and we built out a template. You'll see at the end, uh, we have links to some of the maps, and if you view the source, anyone can take this template and add in their own data, and it would it would work. Um, so we were teaching students essentially not only how to gather the data, but then how to edit, sort of read GeoJSON and edit the content, edit the data within it. Um, we were also teaching students how to vlog, essentially, like how to you know film themselves. I mean, a lot of them already know, right, with their phones and social media um, and so forth, but how to kind of um, frame their storytelling practice. Um, both historically and critically, not just a kind of like I'm here tourism kind of um, experience. Um, and, and then I think critically reflect on you know, their experience as a whole. So they were working within this template um, drawn from Mapbox with you know, a lot of GeoJSON that they can edit. And then in various stages, we've done this a few times, uh, we built an Omeka archive um, for one in our latest project that um, my other two colleagues will focus on. It was a lot more social media focused and then embedded sort of uh, on our map project. So um, in terms of you know, what we teach and, and how we go through it, it's a lot of um, a little bit of technical work, a little bit of media production, and then the kind of cultural and uh, historical critical reflection type of work um, that we focus on. So there are a couple examples that I reference here. And again, you'll see links at the end. Um, but we typically have students choose a theme. They work in groups. Uh, we give them a survey to see you know, who has what skill set and try to pair them together so they can collaborate and really rely on each other. We kind of just function as support, um, both on site and within the semester as they're building out uh, their project and um, ultimately try to get them to you know, a level where the maps function, the videos function, uh, and they're doing this in a way that is you know, uh, reflective and critical uh, overall. So that's kind of like the general introduction to you know, what the project is, where we work, how we kind of operate. Um, 
uh, my other two colleagues will focus on method and content specifically in our latest iteration um, of this project. Good morning. Um, I'm a bit of an interloper here. I'm a scholar of religious studies. So I was aware of these trips uh, that were happening um, at my institution. I became friends and colleagues very quickly with these two um, and uh, saw what they were doing um, in Rome. And uh, through many discussions, um, we realized, I think, that um, there was something that my department me specifically, could offer in terms of content um, to bolster the digital work, the digital production that they were doing. Um, I could provide some more of the content for the students, some more context for them. Um, so I have sort of maybe three things to contribute to the, to the trips that Matt was just talking about. Um, the disciplinary content, right? So making sure that their information is accurate, um, providing critical perspectives from a religious studies standpoint, um, sort of the humanist question that the previous conversation, or, uh, uh, presentation was, was raising. Um, and then my own work in what I would call digital theology, which is um, a field that is a little bit more up and coming. Um, theology in general has been a bit resistant um, to, I would say, maybe some of the DH questions. Um, but my own work focuses on religion and digital culture. I basically take digital categories and I uh, apply them to reinterpret practices, spaces, and doctrine. And so I was interested in doing this not only from a pedagogical standpoint, but also from a scholarly uh, perspective. Um, and then lastly, um, my role in um, at the institution is to um, contribute to curriculum development, specifically our general education program. Um, and uh, the course that we'll be discussing more specifically uh, does follow an interdisciplinary teaching model. Um, I think like, again, our colleagues from India mentioned, the sort of siloing of disciplines, um, and we are very resistant to that um, ourselves um, and trying to um, change that um, at our institution and I think uh, more broadly. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in, and maybe this connects to what some of other folks have talked about, um, expanding digital humanities education to non-DH majors, right? What can we offer students um, in other disciplines? So just briefly about the course, I won't go into too much detail unless anybody is really interested in talking about Roman religion. Um, it's a four-credit interdisciplinary religious studies and digital, human uh, digital humanities slash new media course. Um, and basically before we took the trip to Rome with the students, um, we introduced them to what I would say sort of um, inter interpretive categories for them to think about. So introducing them in a very basic way to visual rhetoric and to um, analyzing spaces and then also talking to them about narrative. Um, and then from, from my big piece of it was the sort of historical and theological background. So giving them enough to not only to be able to analyze the space, but also to, to kind of pair that with the historical and theological um, content. And so it's uh, chronological, right? So Roman religion is in quotations there because of the category of religion, and that's a conversation for another conference. Um, but ancient Christianity, medieval Christianity, reformations, and then um, focusing on a smaller population in Rome, uh, uh, Judaism um, in Rome, which is uh, a fascinating little piece of, of Roman history. Um, so I'll just say something briefly about um, course assignments. So before the trip, we asked students to choose a site, um, and this was a curated list of sites. So we didn't want all of our students picking like the Colosseum, <laughs> so we gave them a list. Um, and these were sites that were um, historically and theologically significant, but maybe a little bit um, less um, uh, present uh, online, especially in social media spaces. Um, to that end, we did have them do a social media um, analysis, so just briefly looking at what pops up on Instagram and TikTok and other um, spaces. Um, and then also we had them do a more sort of extensive Google search analysis, so what narratives um, are being uh, put forward in those spaces as well. What are you finding on TripAdvisor and all of these things. Um, and then while we were in Rome, they, this is when they actually did their digital content. Um, and my, my colleagues can say more about this, but I was learning a lot as well. But the students that we took this year um, in 2023, um, uh, many of them did are not D DH majors like they had been in the past. And so I think the, the biggest hurdle might have been a little bit of intimidation on their part about digital content production. Um, and we were very proud of what they were able to produce, recognizing that they have their own limitations. So I um, was very proud of a theology student that we took, um, and we're going to show hopefully her work here um, today. And then um, on, the, on the back end, uh, coming back from Rome, the um, content production, right? So helping them edit, helping them put together um, their projects. So I'll now turn it over to my colleague, Sarah. Thank you. <coughs> uh, 
Uh, I don't know how clear it was from my colleagues speaking, but this course took place in a spring semester and we took the trip over spring break. So uh, the first part of instruction where we gave all the background info, kind of set them up. Then we went to Rome and then the last couple weeks we did the production and built the map and stuff, which is still in progress. Um, so what I'm gonna be talking about is kind of why we chose this student-focused method and also kind of what we've learned through doing this multiple times and where we're at now with it. So, um, I guess I click with this, huh? <laughs> so the first thing I'll discuss is the evolution of our student-focused methods. So from the beginning, this project was always centered on the student experience and student work. We are a primarily undergraduate surveying institution. Um, you know, we, like both my colleagues said, we get a lot of different types of students in the course, especially because the course won't run unless we have a certain number of students that are willing to go on the trip, right? And I'll kind of discuss that in a second. Um, so as faculty, we provide the frameworks to them. So we provide cultural, creative, and technical frameworks. And I'll go into those in the next slide. But as far as our students, right, we're kind of meeting them where they're at. So we know that the traditional student of today has digital media experience just from living, right? They post on Instagram, they use TikTok, they enjoy taking pictures, right? And they have a decent sense of the skills involved with that, even if they don't necessarily have the vocabulary to do with it. So that's what we try to do before we go is kind of match what they've already got with a way to talk about it, right? So being like, all right, what do you think a good Instagram post looks like? Okay, well, why is it a good post, right? And then we give them kind of vocabulary and ways to talk about it. Um, but we also want to allow them to grow, right? So we introduce some new techniques and um, that allows them then to excel once we actually get to the site, right? When we get to Rome. So the students provide for us the historical research, the personal narratives, and the media capture and production. And when I go to this next slide, you'll, I'll explain it a little bit more. So we ask the students to complete historical research on their chosen map locations before we visit so that they can come to the space with some prior knowledge before students film and cultivate their reflections, we instruct them to study their surroundings and draw from ethnographic methods, right? So participant observation, diaries, video recordings, photography, artifact analysis, so that they have a way to perceive their encounter with what they're seeing. In our first and second iteration, we found this to be a problem, right? We found the students to see it more as just a digital production and not really be doing that critical thinking, not kind of, encountering it as a learning opportunity, but more as a tourism thing, right? I'm gonna get my cute picture with the Coliseum or whatever. And so we wanted to figure out a way to get them thinking or at least give them the tools to be able to think about these sites more critically. So our kind of, I think it was in the second or third week, we taught this piece by Carol Blair, Contemporary US Memorial Sites as Exemplars of Rhetoric's Materiality. And this, um, was kind of a keystone work, and we had them practice it on some memorials that they have been to, right? Some spaces, some artifacts. But Blair's um, piece here has five key framing questions. What is the significance of the text's material existence? What are the apparatuses and degrees of durability displayed by the text? What are the text's modes or possibilities of reproduction or preservation? What does the text do to or with or against other texts? And how does the text act on people? So, you know, they definitely didn't understand it first, right? To put it frankly, um, we had them do a practice exam, uh, a practice project, and one of the students fully just kind of did a report the way you would normally just talk about a memorial, right? And, you know, my feedback to him was, well, we wanted to know what you feel about it, right? What was your experience here? How did you move around the space? What was the text saying to you? Um, and I remember a specific moment when he was like, oh, okay, like, cause he was a biology major. And he was like, I've never been asked questions like that before. So I wasn't ready. Um, and I found that to be an interesting 
thing uh, just because, you know, I guess he just wasn't even used to thinking that way, right? Um, so in that way, we tried to encourage them to more critically think about the cultural space. Um, we also encourage them to be more creative about uh, how they're kind of making their media, right? So since we were talking about texts, we were talking about narratives, when they did their uh, social media analysis and Google search analysis, we asked them, what's the primary story that's being told here? And you know, what story do you think is actually the most important? And then we said, okay, well, what pictures are you always seeing, right? If you see a picture of the Coliseum, for example, it's always from that one angle that makes it look prettiest, right? Why is that? We're asking them those kinds of questions, getting them to consider those kinds of things so that when they get there, they don't just take the same picture that everyone else has taken and tell the same story, right? Because that's one of the problems that we saw in past iterations is people were just repeating what you could have gotten on Wikipedia. There was no nuanced, interesting personal reflection or anything different so our map was more just like another tourism map, right? Um, and we wanted it to be more critical. And then last, the technical, that's pretty straightforward, right? Teaching them how to use cameras, fancier cameras than their phone, but we also allowed them to use their phones. Um, and also using Adobe Premiere, or one student wanted to do a video game, so I showed her how to do that. Um, I think one student wanted to do more of an infographic type thing. So we kind of let them pick from a variety of genres. So we did find overall that there were a couple different um, challenges, right? So one of the challenges is that of the general education population. So a lot of non-experts, they lack comfort with technology. We had to introduce a lot of basics. Additionally, we found challenges with the new media students, right? They were very tech savvy, but you know, weren't into it as a critical thinking exercise. They were like, well, I'm gonna get good stuff for my portfolio, right? This is a tourism thing for me. And then last, institutional support. So the global office for us is who kind of facilitates the trip, which is integral to this. And they keep changing the format of like, what is required? Like, does everyone in the class go, have to go on the trip? Does some people go and some people stay? Like, can it be multiple classes? Can it be a single class? And so that's kind of tough. And then in that context, how do we articulate the class and the trip and the project to be able to recruit? And then last, how can we allow less economically privileged students to per participate in this, right? Because at this point, trips are like at minimum $2,000. And that's just really not accessible to, for our population, the average student. Um, I guess we are out of time. Uh, but when our current map is finished, you can look at these. The interactive narrative is a, uh, Twine video game, right? So depending on your definition of video game, but I believe it's a video game. And uh, it's about St. Agnes, the church, and kind of, you would explain it better as a theologian, uh, but it's theoretically St. Agnes's church, but her remains are in a corner, right? And so it's kind of all about finding Agnes. That's what it's kind of about. And then, uh, the video narrative is kind of just a regular, more typical example, right? And that's the biology student too, who did the video narrative. And so those are the links. The first two maps are fully complete. The third map, all the um, spots, the locations are marked, but all of the content isn't in yet. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>